Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Let me just give a claimer out this morning um, that I'm no longer in junior high and high school. And so if it sounds like I'm going through puberty this morning, I'm not. Uh, my voice may crack. I have had a horrible cough uh, the last uh, four days. So excuse me um, if I sound very weird up here. <laughs> but uh, hey, if you're new, good to have you here. My name is Mark Lohman, and I'm the associate pastor here at New Life. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the favorite things that I love to do, and maybe this sounds really odd to you, but I love visiting other churches. And so, of course, you know, about a month ago, my wife and I were in Indiana. And so we were able to visit two new churches. And one of the churches that we went to was this really large, extremely well-organized church. And so we're there at the beginning of service. The first song that they start off with is just this like high energy, up tempo, super exciting, like you want to dance and make noise and all this other stuff. And you know, it's pretty normal I think for a lot of American churches, except then the next song was the exact same way. And then the song after that was the exact same way. And even by the fourth song, there's still this up-tempo, high-energy, exciting, let's throw a party sense of vibe. <clears throat> See, there it was. And, uh, man, that's going to be embarrassing. <clears throat> um, but it, this got me thinking, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, what? something's rubbing me the wrong way here this morning. And I realized I wasn't in the most chipper of moods. And then I thought, okay, well, hold on. But what if someone's here... Not to be extreme or anything, but who's lost a loved one. Maybe they just got laid off. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe they just got diagnosed with a disease. What in the world are they going to think about all this exciting high energy music going on? I mean, it, it almost kind of rubbed me the wrong way in that it seemed fake. It didn't seem realistic. It seemed very superficial. And then I, I realized, you know, I think most churches across America that follow Jesus, I think a lot of our worship music and just tone in general, I'm not sure how in touch we are with some of kind of the more depressing, negative emotions that human beings know. We just do our happy-go-lucky kind of count it all joy praise songs. And so I'm, I'm not bagging on contemporary praise music this morning. I actually love it. I love the energy. I love the noise. I love the passion. And I think there is actually a lot of really deep biblical, biblical reasons um, to do things that way. But I do find it fascinating and really disturbing um, that virtually zero out of the top 150 worship songs right now sing in churches across the nation virtually zero of them have anything to do with lament, with grief, with mourning. And shouldn't our worship music and our, our lives as worship, because worship is not just a thing that's music, I mean, but, but shouldn't it engage all the feelings that we encounter as humans rather than simply kind of distracting us from our pain, <clears throat> putting us in a good mood for a preacher's talk? I mean, we experience things such as love and joy and hope, absolutely, but we also experience things like sadness and depression and anxiety, and the list goes on. And so this is one of the reasons why I think we, we've chosen this new series, new summer sermon series, that, say that five times fast, that's a, a tongue twister, but summer in the Psalms. And I think everyone, follower of Jesus or not, I think we've all probably heard of the Psalms, right, Psalm 23, there's some really common ones. Um, but what I think we, maybe we forget, <clears throat> there it was again second time, um, is that, you know, really these, it's just a collection of, of poetry and music from 3,000 years ago that these authors who were just so incredibly bold before God, and they expressed their anger, they expressed their doubt, their lament, and yes, their, their joy and their happiness and their hope. And so the Psalms were literally the hymn book, like the, the liturgy that ancient Israel used. I mean, these were the songs that they sang and the prayers that they prayed 
during their worship service. And so I think one of the main reasons why the psalmists have always been so powerful for about 3,000 years is that they do connect with all of life as we know it, right? Rich, just poetry, prose and rhythm, anger, doubt, disbelief, hope, joy, praise. So we're going to just for nine weeks kind of pick out special psalms that depict different human emotions as we know real life to be, right? We're not here just to kind of look good, to look like we're happy. We want to encounter Jesus at the depths of our being. And that means different seasons of life for all of us. So to go back to the experience that I shared at this church, and I won't say their name, with contemporary music being so much of praise, I think one is shocked to realize, what's the most common topic in the Psalms? It's actually lament. And so if that's a weird word, really all lament means is to passionately express your grief and sorrow and pain. That is the number one topic in the Psalms. And so you have the, the biblical authors of this song book, like I said, I mean, they are just brutally honest before God. Some of them are angry at him. Some of them are doubting him. And they're saying that. So it just makes me, I mean, what if we sing songs like that? Right? I mean, much less t- actually talk to God that way. So as I was preparing this week, I realized, I think the Bible is actually far more honest than most of its readers. And so, if you don't believe me, we're going to dig in this morning, Psalm 22. It's going to be the first psalm that we check out here in this series for nine weeks. Um, This psalm, maybe you've heard it before or not, it's written by a guy named King David. David's a a really well-known guy, maybe you've heard stories about him. And, and David, he, he gets right into it. So I'm going to read from this on page 381 in these free Bibles that are underneath the chairs in front of you. And, and David doesn't mess around. He gets to the point right away. He says this, <clears throat> verse 1 of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the cries of anguish, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. And so when we talk about lament, I think what we're really talking about is actually permission. Permission. For maybe a guy who just got divorced and feels alone and angry and full of disbelief to say, God, where are you? Don't you hate divorce? Permission, I think for the single lady who's in her mid to late 30s, 40s, in a a Christian culture that celebrates marriage and looks down upon you the older you get and and if you still remain single, for her to say, God, I'm alone. Where are you? Permission. I think for the couple who's tried to get pregnant for years, doctor's appointments, thousands of dollars, every test but is told that they're infertile. God, don't you care about us? Are you indifferent? Are you listening? Permission. For the cancer patient to weep, to cry, and to pray for healing. And I'd imagine sometime in one of those examples that I just gave where someone is just feeling abandoned by God in the midst of pain, that maybe this thought runs through their mind. Well, 
you know, God, you've answered my prayers before. I, I, I've prayed to you before and you've answered. I mean, my parents have. You answered them. My grandparents, I come from this great family of faith. And you've always answered our prayers before. So maybe you'll do it again at this point. David echoes those exact feelings. He writes that, verse 3. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises, in you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. Furthermore, maybe that couple who's been told they're infertile <clears throat> has also thought this. Hey, God, you know, ha we've been following you since we were just little. I mean, we grew up in the church. I've all, we've always tithed. I was on youth group leadership team. I mean, I just evangelized hundreds of people during college. I've done all the religious things of following Jesus since I was just a little baby. Where are you, God? David. Well, he echoes that too. Verse 9. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near and there is no one to help. So, of course, I think at this point in someone's journey, <clears throat> the silence of God in the midst of pain, abandonment, perhaps then friends, enemies, opponents begin to ask questions, shake their head at you. What, why are you crying out to a deaf God? And so for the anxiously single lady... Maybe her enemy are her friends. Hey, Jane, I just got engaged. Are you so happy for me? Oh, hey, won't you be in my bridal party? Maybe for the couple who's infertile, their enemies, their opponents. Hey, you, you know what? I think the problem here is that you guys just aren't trusting God enough. If you would just trust God more, I think he would probably give you a couple kids. Oh, and by the way, do you want to come babysit for my husband and I tonight for our five kids under the age of five? Yeah, true story, people. If you just devote your life to God, Maybe things will work out. And so without any pity, any help from others, fear and weakness set in. A heart that was once hopeful begins to melt like wax. And someone in this situation, their body's probably experiencing a lot of depression and anxiety. And of course that manifests itself physically. And so they experience little things like dry cotton mouth, a bunch of other things. David echoes this as well. Verse 12. <clears throat> Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. That's just a region where there's really well-fed, strong cattle. Roaring lions that tear their prey Open their mouths wide against me. And I am poured out like water and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. There's the cotton mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. And by the way, dogs in the ancient world weren't like my little 11 pound chihuahua. Uh, they were not man's best friend. They were scavengers and beasts. 
And so these dogs surround him, and a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display, probably from, from lack of nourishment. And people stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them, and they cast lots for my garment. Turning this person's clothes into a raffling game. So, <laughs> welcome to church Sunday morning. I mean, it's no wonder that David at this point feels less than a human. He feels of no worth. He feels less than even the lowest of animals. Verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. And they say this, he trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. With an ounce of life and energy left. The divorced guy, the infertile couple, the cancer patient, the single lady, and King David. One last time. Verse 19, they say, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength and come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouths of lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. <laughs> Maybe we don't pray that, right? <clears throat> There's one more person. Who is also grieved and lamented. This sense of divine abandonment. And expresses that to the God of the universe. Everything that was read in this poem, this prayer. This person felt and experienced the exact same thing. Let's check that person out. Let's go to the best book in the Bible. The book of Mark. You guys think I'm joking. <laughs> so Mark chapter 15, verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22. <clears throat> there may be no greater inner pain than the loss of a close, desired relationship. For most of us, you know, it's painful just to receive criticism <laughs> from like a friend or a co-worker. It's even more heartbreaking if that happens in the midst of kind of, you know, a, a loving, romantic relationship. But if your spouse or your parent or your child abandons you and leaves you, that is absolutely devastating. Many would say that the pain of a divorce or losing a loved one is actually far, far worse than any type of physical pain. So imagine then some type of parental or spousal love that hadn't just lasted a couple years, not even a lifetime, but eternity. Christianity says that Jesus, God in the flesh, like God became a human. Jesus existed eternally before with God, right? With the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son, right? That, that's what we call the Trinity. The point of the Trinity, though, isn't just some abstract doctrine. The Trinity shows us 
that God, like at the core of his being, at the fabric of who he is, is nothing but love and intimacy and relationship. Jesus had a perfectly loving and intimate relationship with his father. Here's the great mystery. To redeem our brokenness, you know, God didn't like do some mighty thing full of power, whatever that is. He sent his beloved son to suffer for you on the cross to redeem us from evil, suffering. And so all the pain, the fallenness of this world was on the shoulders of Jesus at the cross. What, what separates us from the divine, Jesus bore on the cross. And so for the first time in his life, for eternity, in the midst of just physical pain, right, bones sticking out, psychological pain, people mocking him and taking his garments off and just treating them like the lotto or something. Jesus is completely abandoned by his father. He is infinitely separated from the best thing that he's ever known. God in Jesus suffered to the highest degree possible. And he lamented, and he cried, and he grieved, and he did that to his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God is not only the God of the sufferers, but the God who suffers. Was one author put it, instead of explaining our suffering, God shares it. Because he knows that mere answers are cold, but his arms are warm. Someone who lost their son at the age of 25 while climbing in the mountains wrote this. But please, don't say it's not really so bad. Because it is. If you think your task as comforter is to tell me that really, all things considered, it's not so bad, you do not sit with me in my grief, but you place yourself off in the distance, away from me. Over there, you are of no help. What I need to hear from you is that you recognize how painful it is. I need to hear from you that you are with me in my desperation. To comfort me, you have to come close. You have to come sit with me on my morning bench. God has sat with us on the morning bench. God is not only the God of the sufferers, but the God who suffers. Jesus, God in the flesh, in the midst of pain and abandonment and forsakenness, God is nowhere to be near. Did Jesus want literal answers in that moment? Do we really want answers in our suffering? Or... And I'm not discounting answers. In the midst of our suffering, do we really just want someone to comfort us? To be there with you. God is not only the God of the sufferers, but the God who suffers. And instead of explaining our suffering, he shares it. Because he knew that mere answers are cold, but his arms are warm. And so using a psalm of lament, 
Jesus models for us and he comforts us in the midst of our own pain and grief because he knows what that is like. He's been there. He's done that. And actually far more so than we can imagine. So are you here this morning and are you grieving? Are you lamenting? Do you feel abandoned? Men. You know, our culture says that men must be strong. Tears are for women. Tears are a sign of weakness. And women, I mean, well, they're allowed to be weak, right? And so I don't want to say this because it sounds like some stupid bumper sticker on a car. <laughs> if you have this bumper sticker, I'm sorry. Uh, just realized that. Better go check my car. Real men cry. Women. You know, I think being emotional, it, it may come easier to you. And culture often depicts that as a weakness. But really, being emotional in the midst of your pain and suffering is the most courageous and honest thing that you can do. Jesus, on the cross, in his dying last breath, laments and grieves and directs that towards his Father. So, I mean, it sounds like a weird question to ask, but are you lamenting before God? Some people may think, hey, Mark, isn't this kind of disrespectful? Isn't this kind of irreverent? First thing I would say was, though, I mean, according to the scriptures, it's not. I mean, just look at God's poetry throughout the Psalms. It is nothing but lament. Second of all, I think maybe you're working with kind of like a lower, smaller view of God. I mean, think about this. Do you not think that God already knows how you're thinking and feeling inside? Like, are, are, are you going to, like, take him, you know, off guard? Or are you going to surprise him if you direct your grief towards him? Like, like is he going to not know how to respond and react to that? Do you think he can't handle your grief? The best friends... Right, the, cl the close relationships that we have in life. What can you do in those? <clears throat> you can be yourself. You can be honest. And you can be real. And you can just say it as it is. And the other person will just listen. They're not going to try to correct you. They're not going to try to fix the situation. They're not going to tell you, hey, God has a plan for your life. Who cares what you're feeling now? No, they're going to probably say, hey, or hopefully they'll say, I'm so sorry. What you're going through is so tough right now. And I just want to mourn with you. I just want to cry with you. Maybe I want to laugh with you, depends right on the tone. That's exactly what God did for us in Jesus. He knows what it's like. Because he was abandoned, he was forsaken, he grieved, and he lamented. I'm not, just to clarify, and I'm not talking about the type of lament where you're just like chewing out God and just full of bitterness, just cursing him. Okay? I'm not sure actually how healthy that is. Although one of the psalms actually does come pretty close to that. Psalm 88. But I want you this morning, just, I mean, guys, let's just be real. Like, just pull off the mask. Let's, let's stop. I mean, just be real before God. <laughs> Cry. Grieve. Tell him, God, I, I don't know where you are. What the heck is going on? And we can do this precisely because God is with us in our pain. And so there's no like 
one formulaic way to grieve. If there was, like, I'll hand something out. I don't know. So this looks different for all of us, right? For some of us, I think we need to grieve and we need to lament through, like, journaling and blogging and a diary, right? Whatever it is. Maybe it's, maybe it's playing music or listening to music, right? That's actually just what the psalmist did. They made music when they, when they grieved. Maybe you do it through prayer. Maybe you go running. It, it doesn't matter. But we need to grieve before God. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, well, life's just peachy for me. I don't need to grieve. I don't need to lament. I mean, I got a great job. I got a great family. I go to the gym eight times a week, even though that's not possible. Things are great, Mark. I, and I get that. I, I think that's probably a large amount of us in this room. But on the flip side, I think there's people in this room right now who are absolutely grieving and lamenting. For those of us who are like on Sky 9, here's the invitation for you this morning. To come alongside the people who are grieving. And if you don't know people in your life who are grieving, I'm probably going to ask you some other questions because I, I find that hard to believe. Come alongside them and pray, God, where are you with Mark? What, I mean, what's going on here? That's being the hands and feet of Jesus. That's bearing each other's burdens. Far better than, hey, let me just, you know, quote Romans 8.28 and Jeremiah 29.11 at you. Not sure if that's probably the best way of going about things. Secondly, what about our nation and our world today? I think we have a fair amount to lament and grieve about. Followers of Jesus, our first response to tragedy of any kind is to simply but powerfully grieve. And I don't know about you, but the last few weeks I've heard a lot of tragedy on the news. And so the church, we offer up a voice and we protest and we say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Lamenting is actually probably the most spiritual thing that you can do. Because it says, this is not the way it's supposed to be. So you only grieve and you only lament over things that are really important to you. Are you coming alongside others? Where are you in this? <clears throat> Different tone this morning, right? <laughs> A bunch of cheery, happy-go-lucky worship songs. But as we talked about last week, we grieve, we lament, but we do so with hope. It's interesting, as I said earlier, laments are the most common topic in the Psalms, but here's what's fascinating. In all the Psalms of lament, and there's about 60 to 70 of them, only one or two do not end with praise and hope. And so it is absolutely biblical, and this is my point this morning, to grieve and to lament before the God of the universe. That is needed and healthy and biblical. But at the same time, it's also just as much biblical to go from grief to hope. Right? And, and for some people that takes years, so I'm not putting the timeline on that. <clears throat> And so you have these poets and these musicians just so honest, so bold before God, ticked off. But at the end, they always cling to the promises of God to rescue them. So you see this stark contrast in the psalm this morning, and we're almost done. Go back to Psalm 22. Verse 21, David, I mean, he's still saying, rescue me, God, from lions and tigers and bears, oh my, all this other stuff. <clears throat> Verse 22, it changes. Tone, tone change. And before I, I read this, I love what a commentator said. He said this, the grimness of the present has the first word. The praise of the future has the last. So David's abandoned. He's forsaken. 
but he ends with praise. He offers us two avenues of hope. The first, verse 22. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly, meaning like in, in the church service. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. And Jacob and Israel, those are uh, just names for the people of God. Why? Verse 24. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. David, who doesn't feel the presence of God in the midst of pain, nonetheless moves towards God in confidence that God will hear him. He finds support and hope amongst his own people in this church service. And so I think for a lot of us, you are moved to the point of despair. You got nothing left. And it may be that as with David here, one of the best things that you can do, the first response of hope before you is just to be among God's people. You know, the church is the place where the mighty acts of God are told even if you can't see them. The church is the place where the praises of God are said, even if you can't say them yourself. The church is the place where the faithfulness of God, great is thy faithfulness, is said, even yet you just can't see them right now. So, do you have people around you, like people other than your family that you are in close relationship with who can support you and help you in the worst of times. Right? This is why we value life groups here. You need to be in community. And it's probably too late if you wait till something happens. We get together because we can't do it alone. And so David, amongst his community in this church service, he's reminded that, hey, we, we used to be slaves in Egypt. We cried out to God. God answered us. He delivered us. And I don't, I don't see that now, God, but I'm just going to remember that. And I'm going to bank on that because you say that you are a God who is unchanging. And what you did in the past, you'll do again sometime in the future. For followers of Jesus, we look back to the cross because the cross is proof that Jesus, and to use David's words, has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. And at the cross we see that God is not only the God of the sufferers, but the God who suffers. And he suffered to end suffering once and all. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 on the cross. And I, m most of us scholars think that he knew the way that Psalm 22 ended. He knows the end of it, hope and praise. Jesus knew that his cross wouldn't have the last word, but the cross would turn into resurrection. He was experiencing real loss and real grief, absolutely. But his father is going to undo that. He's going to reverse it. And that turns into resurrection. Jesus grieved, but not as one without hope. And we follow Jesus in grieving, but not as one without hope. There's this vision of hope in the scriptures. Don't worry about turning there. I'll read it for us. It's essentially what the Bible ends with. The book of Revelation I just want to read this over us this morning. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. 
And then he said, write this down for these words are what? They're trustworthy and they're true. David, midst of pain, he now moves, and this is what we're going to end on, this huge vision of hope before him. His grief turns into praise because of it. He envisions a future. Everything wrong in this world is turned on its head. And God sets everything right. And everybody will know that God's power and his ability to rescue. He ends with this, verse 26. The poor, right, the ones who've been abandoned will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth, everyone will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. And all the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him and those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, his ability to set things right. Declaring to a people yet on board, he has done it. He has set everything right. Though you may not know it and you may not feel it, God is on his throne. And somehow, some way, this world and his creation is moving toward his good purposes. And just like Jesus at the cross, he felt abandoned, isolated, he grieved and he lamented. But resurrection. The same dynamic of grief and hope is true for us today. So I don't know how this hits you this morning. For David, suffering moved him towards God rather than away from him. And so I think the goal of this morning is just to encourage you to just be honest before God. To grieve to lament because God is not a God who doesn't know what that's like. And he will rescue you at some point. And so I'm going to invite the music team back up. We're going to go into our time of response right now. Some of these things may take on new meaning this morning. We have communion. An act that symbolizes, right, the body of Jesus, his blood, poured out for you. God is with you in your pain on the cross. There's a prayer team in the back by the organ. They will pray with you for anything, and they will grieve with you. There's candles signifying hope in the midst of abandonment. Do what you need to do. We have a song that's going to be played here, and actually the next couple songs that are chosen on purpose. Okay? Just reflect and grieve. Listen to the words. We need to slow down. And so at this time, the ushers are going to come forward. They're going to collect our offering. If you're new here, no pressure to give. If you're family here, this is how we live resurrection in this community. And so we just ask for the Holy Spirit to minister to us now.